Hi everyone. Hello. Um, welcome to the free, uh, the digital free market roadshow that we have to we have to uh, do uh, unfortunately in a uh, online format this time. Um, we're going to have three days of online uh, events, uh, basically through Facebook Live. We're going to have a number of guests uh, throughout these three days. Uh, discussing basically the philosophical, economical, and political aspects regarding the um, the coronavirus epidemic, right? And we're starting off today with the um, philosophical side of things. And uh, I'd like to introduce Agnieszka Blonka from um, from Poland. She is a researcher in the field of uh, information war, uh, state propaganda with. Uh, experience in data science and also uh, with um, research uh, in the field of uh, psychology of totalitarian regimes uh, and she's going to be speaking to to us um, today first of all um, before we get into that however i would like to thank uh, our partners uh, that means basically the free market roadshow um, uh, the global organization uh, also to the romanian and american university in bucharest who have helped us uh, to uh, to organize this event and to of course all of our partners uh, local uh, national and international have made this uh, this event uh, this event possible so uh, i'm going to uh, welcome uh, agnieszka in uh, into uh, into the call. Hi. Hello, Agnieszka. Hello. Thank you for right. the kind introduction. Uh, thank you as well for taking the time to speak to us. Um, we'll just uh, we'll just uh, let you uh, you know go go into the go into the point, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna loop in at the end, and perhaps take a few questions if we have the chance. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so thank you again, Sorin, and um, it is a great honor to start this series of meetings. So when coming up with a banner sentence that you may see soon, I was thinking mm -hmm. about what is core to all of the discussions that we will be having in these three days. And the core of it is a, well, certain living entity. And it's not the virus, of course, because virus isn't technically alive. There's not much to debate when it comes to the nature of it, but it is a human being. So all that we will talk about here in the next three days, philosophy, economics, political strategies, those are all research and strategy areas that grew around the basic question of who a person is, how a person should be treated, and who is to have a legitimate power over a person. So we are basically talking about human nature. So as we know, there are many philosophical takes on these questions, and they then result in different political strategies. So, and, and whether these strategies enhance human happiness or not, that depends on whether the philosophy captured the human nature as it is. So my argument, and it's a general take of personalist, but also of Ayn Rand, is that a person is an end in themselves. So each of us has unique intrinsic value as a human being, unique aspirations and hopes, and we are the sole actors that can be in charge of them. And of course, there have been many philosophies that claim something very different. And in consequence, they treat people like data points, like elements of some kind of non-existent great good. And they are not seeing human beings for who they are. They are not respecting them and violating their boundaries. And that in the end will result in emotional trauma for these people. Uh, they will be stripped of agency, of responsibility and of self-worth just because they are treated like something that they are not. So such philosophies are based on false anthropology. So that, of course, is true for all of the collectivist philosophies, but even utilitarians, which claim that ultimately they see the individual, they still choose an approach that in a way effectively lies about human nature. So, and I also think that here is where philosophy, political philosophy links with psychology and the view of Ayn Rand, also the view of personalists, uh, the view that a human being is an enemy themselves, that is linked with the best possible outcome psychology-wise. So generally, how we treat another human being exists on a spectrum. So there is this extremely narcissistic end where we treat people like objects that are just supposed to serve a certain role or I, are supposed to be a pawn for a common good that doesn't even exist. And if these people do not serve their purpose, we throw them away, uh, we abuse them, we pretend they don't exist, or 
if that's in politics, we throw them in jail or kill them. So that's the extreme narcissistic end. And this, this extreme empathetic end, this personalist, but also objectivist in how Ayn Rand would view it, uh, is where we treat another human being as an end in themselves. So we have appropriate boundaries. We see them as unique and valuable actors that are responsible for their own life. So we do not want to use them abusively, but make business with them respectfully. So this empathetic approach to a human being really honors human nature as it is. And uh, the, the take is, I do not feel entitled to anything from you. You do not feel entitled to anything from me, but let's see if we can make things better for each other, if it's fine with you. And if anyone engages in any entitlement, that's crossing a boundary. So you're not treated properly anymore. You're becoming an object. And if it's on a political scale, your natural rights are violated. And uh, of course, there are all shades of between treating another human as an object and treating another human as a human. But how does the state treat us? Well, of course, it's kind of far away from this empathetic spectrum. And the more totalitarian the state, the closer it is to this objectifying narcissistic end. But it's not only true on the political scale, but for scale, smaller communities, workplaces, families. Well, some people do have these personality disorders that make them uh, possible to interact with others only to exert control. And the relationships, the relationships such people form will be toxic and result in trauma in their victims because those victims were reduced to an object. So these phenomena are known in clinical psychology, and I claim that they are actually transferable to political psychology. So if we act as if a human being is not an end in himself, we will traumatize him. And there are known comparisons between Eastern and Western Germany that show the mental and physical trauma of the Easterners. So that's the general framework I will be making my argument in. And those are, of course, some extreme examples, but how does this relate to the current crisis, to the lockdown, to the stay at home orders, to, to what the governments are doing today uh, in the pandemic? So, well, mostly there is this curve, right? And we are all told to flatten the curve. And if you look at the y axis of the curve, these are numbers of people that are infected. So does it already mean that plotting this kind of curve is objectifying, disrespectful because, hey, I'm a human being and I cannot be put on the y-axis? Of course not, because uh, biology or statistics or medical science doesn't answer questions about human nature. It answers limited scientific questions. So uh, they're just dealing with narrow phenomena. So this flattening the curve is the answer to a question. Given certain rate of possible transmission of the virus and uniform patterns of human interaction, how prolonged social distancing is needed to make the healthcare system sustainable is in such crisis? This is the only question that uh, this curve is the answer to assuming certain uh, patterns of human interaction. It's a narrow scientific question. It doesn't answer anything about who a human being is and how a human being should be treated and what should be done. Uh, and well, that's a side comment. Uh, the key here is uh, the healthcare system capacity, right? We are already dealing with overregulated health healthcare systems around the world, and we do not have the data on what their capacity and the resources would be without the state control licensing and well, what have you. So I suppose we all agree that there is a tremendous and heartbreaking waste in this department. And so the lockdowns and distancing were mandated also to kind of duct tape an already broken system. But anyway, all those biological questions do not answer who should mandate the distancing, how it should be done. They do not answer any questions on what you should do with your own life because they can't. So the only thing we have here is certain externality, the virus. And we have to acknowledge that it may be harmful to other people if we choose some activities that otherwise would have been harmless. So that poses that philosophical problem of, well, whether in such circumstances, someone else has the right to forcefully ban us from engaging in these activities. So uh, 
it's not that easy of a question because what well, we know not everyone will voluntarily comply not everyone may have the understanding and manners to wash their hands appropriately but does it mean that they get to be told go to your room like they are children so i am all an advocate of individual responsibility and manners and i actually think a lot of libertarian arguments they boil down to we should be civilized enough for liberty because not everything can be solved perfectly by law and people actually they prove to be very resourceful when they are given credit so if someone should step up a bit then treating them as responsible adults makes them behave as a responsible adult and i know that may sound utopian but we need to start somewhere and i can already see that someone would say that a crisis of this kind it's not the best time to test it. Well, maybe not, but what they are doing instead is worse anyway, and has worse consequences on human life and on mental health. And again, mental health is crucial for maintaining liberty and also thrives in liberty. So I will always robustly say that nobody has any rights to effectively objectify another human being. So maybe it's really hard to pinpoint what's legitimate and what is not at the liberty end of the spectrum in face of such externality but right now it doesn't even matter what is perfect because we are so far away from perfect so we are treated like cattle and we should be hating it so this is not who we are and it's making us sick and not in our lungs but in our heads which are far more important uh, however and well that is kind of a tragic reflection about today's state of humanity it is too easy to manipulate people with fear and I will repeat after many others that fear is the beginning of the end of liberty. But if we go back to that curve, at, there, at no point the result of epidemiology research, and well, let's assume it's all true and correct. So at no point does that research state what the government should do to us. It is not normative, but it is being used to impose quite drastic measures. And under what assumption or under what excuse? So they think they know better what we need in life, assuming that health and answers to all these medical questions it, is all that there is to human life. And it, but again, medical research is limited science. And there we really are data points. But medical science does not deal with human nature. And we are objectified if the government uses this research as an excuse to lock us down. Because that's already uh, the kind of action where we have no say in. And the problem is that when we are being locked down, we are not being locked down as data points, but as humans that have weddings, fellowships, baby showers planned, as humans that like to watch rainbows and pet stray cats, while humans that are battling various mental health problems and need to meet friends in cafes or need various kinds of therapy, and people that are running small businesses that are very important to the community and being very tight of bu on budget. And all this is scattered knowledge and all these hidden opportunity costs and all this scattered knowledge will never make their way to any kind of simulation. So we will never know just how harmful the lockdowns were. And well, it is immoral and contrary to human nature because uh, a human being has a natural right to choose their own risk and their own way of life. Granted, as long as it doesn't harm others, but well, we are the species that made all these discoveries and technology possible. So we should be able to grasp the idea of distancing and hygiene. And businesses will naturally want people to feel safe inside. So the more decentralized such decisions are, and of course the perfect decentralization would be up to the level of the individual, but still the more, the more decentralized they are, the more of this soft scattered knowledge we can take into account and the less economic and mental damage will occur. So this one business owner knows uh, how much savings he has, how these handful of families are dependent on him in one small town and nobody else does. Like this elderly lady knows that a solitary walk outside where she gets to smell the flowers keeps her going and nobody else does know that. And there are grandparents that would probably prefer to attend their grandchildren's wedding and have one last highlight night even at the expense of a shorter life. But the problem is nobody gave them that choice to make. And someone in the government knew better. And that's disrespectful and that's abusive. So not to mention the, the horrifying suicide problem. 
So, well, in the mainstream, talking about that false dichotomy between life and economy uh, has been very loud. And of course, there is no choice or battle between life and economy, because life is economy in the way that it is interacting with others, meeting others, providing them service, creating, producing, and what have you. So if someone thought it's appropriate to force others to forsake all that in order to ensure that they breathe without them having any say in that, well, he kind of confused us with vegetables. So even now, well, the issue of uh, the economy gets back to the picture when reopenings are being discussed, but they still see us as, as objects and they do not see how organic and intrinsic to human life economy like that is. So they try to make some kind of utilitarian calculations when they discuss reopening, minimum damages, deliberating what to open when and why. But these calculations are kind of entirely missing the point. So we are looking at various graphs that answer limited scientific questions. It's all knowledge in the making. The conclusions don't even have to be correct because the pandemic is not over and we are just learning now. But then if someone in the policy making world would again use those graphs to try to limit the damage, well, that's the same as maximizing happiness in a way. So what happens if he tries to do math on something you cannot do math on? Because uh, you cannot do math on human happiness. What does it mean to be happy for me? It's, it's different for, for you or anyone else. And maximize or minimize is a mathematical word. So we would need to take my happiness, your happiness, happiness of that girl who bullied you in high school, happiness of that plumber, happiness of that professor and baker, and then what? Add them together, integrate them, uh, define them as a function of some kind of factor, and then maximize given that factor. Well, it's even crazier than adding apples and oranges because that's not who we are. That sounds ridiculous. So. It's not only bad social science that tries to make impossible calculations and doesn't recognize the true nature of a human being, but it's also stepping over the line to even be asking these questions because it should never be up to them to tell us what to do with our lives. We are the only ones that really know and we are the ones that have the right to decide. And well, by the way, if, for example, someone thinks I'm not going to take into account safety measures, that's kind of an insult to, to, to my maturity. And I wonder if you guys are feeling the same. So what is important here and what is entirely missing is that the job of the political system is not to keep us safe and happy. It's not to save our jobs and lives. It is to preserve the rights that we naturally have. And we live in nature that is humbling. We cannot really uh, fine tune everything. And there is no way we can make utilitarian calculations because our happiness by nature is not something anyone can do math on. So all of this went wrong this year, or maybe this year actually showed how wrong things really were underneath anyway. Anyway, we need to strive to be well-mannered, educated, and to handle things in a mature way for our own sake. Because if we are not that, then liberty can be easily taken away from us and they will find arguments to do it. So that crisis may be a great excuse for them and that's scary. So uh, this is my take on uh, on the subject. I think, we'll, I think a lot of people later in the event will have uh, various comments and takes on that. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agnieszka, for uh, for that uh, that presentation. We actually do have two uh, two questions that we can uh, we can put forward to you uh, if you um, if you'd like to to help us with an answer. So, which country do you think uh, from the entire world deals or have dealt with the virus uh, and the situation it created the best way on a social level? This is from Christy Diakon, one of our followers. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, I. I don't think it's uh, it's a bit early to answer this question. However, I am right now joining you from Malmö, Sweden, 
And well, I actually, I took a ferry uh, last month uh, for family reasons, but also I very much prefer to say to myself to stay inside instead of having the police tell me that, which started happening in Poland. So when it comes to me, I'm really happy to be here in Sweden. So on a social level, we will see what happens after the crisis and we will have the, the data and the understanding that we don't have now. Uh, however, I would say that the fact that there are no lockdowns in Sweden is uh, probably the best for people's mental health and they can then make th their own decisions as much as possible in terms of w how they're going to handle it, what they what they will be doing. But of course, they are there are trade-offs and the problem is that, there, that this virus is very new and I think that it was never about being uh it, it was always about the fear of uncontrolled death it was always about control in the sense that people are a bit freaking out that they cannot control death because they want to control death um and uh, another point is that uh well after 9 11 the air force changed forever and that's a bit scary so it's scary what may change forever after this year and if we go back to what happened at this really unexpected sudden crisis before in history, usually we learn that the measures that were taken were the worst possible. But I'm really happy to be in Malmö and we will see what we get to know in the next months. All right. Fantastic. And I think we have time for uh, for another question. Um, this is from Laurentiu. Uh, besides uh, incompetence and lack of responsibility of the political actors, uh, do you think there might be other agendas at play, like centralizing more and more powers in the hands of the government uh, in the interest of the uh, quote unquote common good? Well, I think that's certainly possible. However, it could be that this crisis is being used in that way that it's uh, kind of a nice side effect for them. Uh, of course, mm -hmm. we were preparing for a financial financial crisis uh, for a while now, and uh, well, it's true that uh, Austrian economics does not have any means to say when it will happen. But we will know. We know that it, it, with the existing uh, policies of the of the central banking system, at some point it has to happen, and we will end up in hyperinflation. And people were thinking that, well, it's about time. And now this uh, coronavirus crisis is so conveniently uh, in 2020 that the crisis that would have been probably in 2020 anyway can be very easily blamed on the virus. So nobody is questioning the financial system. That's great. That's a great side effect. Uh, also, people were saying that, OK, uh, maybe they want to change our habits if we stay inside for a long time we will be not used to bigger gatherings and we will be not used to protesting and uh that's great for the government if they want to seize more power i it probably wasn't the agenda but now that it happened it's a great side effect for centralized power so uh even though if it wasn't like planned in the books uh, I suppose that the current situation has many uh, opportunities for the centralized power to grow and for our people's mindset to uh, kind of, well, we, in a crisis, actually humanity tends to trust the government more out of fear and they mm -hmm. are going to use every inch of that. So, All right. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, I think we'll we'll leave it at that. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to joining uh, for joining us today. Um, we'll be in touch. Um, and uh, for everybody else watching, we'll be back at uh, two minute, uh, twenty minutes. Uh, uh, actually, no, forty minutes past uh, past uh, three uh, with the next show. Uh, Callum Nicholson uh, with a very interesting topic. Uh, we'll be back then. Thank you. Thank you again, Agnieszka.